afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The American Red Cross is urging eligible donors to give blood. It's a gift that could save someone's life. For a variety of reasons, blood donations tend to dip in the summer months, but the need for blood remains constant throughout the year. Across the Fence spoke with a Red Cross representative about what we can all do to help save lives. So the current situation with blood in general is usually once we come close to the summer months, we have a lot of folks who, you know, they go on vacation, they travel, um, kids aren't in school anymore. So the blood supply and blood donation in general tends to drop off a bit. Um, it's historically always kind of been that way. So usually around May, we raise that awareness, you know, April, May in the springtime. We really raise up the awareness. We have some campaigns for folks, um, you know, I know Friday through Monday, I believe we're giving away free t-shirts, you know, so there's always some promotional items just to get people interested and in kind of walking through the door. Um, but the current situation, it is um, pretty dire. And when I say dire, I mean in the sense that hospitals and the Red Cross itself feel comfortable having a certain amount of supply on stock, essentially. And when we get close to that limit, that threshold, then we start to put out some, some appeals, you know, the urgent need or critical need. And sometimes it also includes specific blood types. So it may not be that the blood supply in general is in need, but it may be we really need O negative blood or we really need um, AB blood. Um, so it really kind of, uh, it's all an ebb and flow process. We do rely heavily on the colleges in the area. So once the summer comes, a lot of them go home. So we see definitely a dip as far as presentation of college students and things of that nature. So we also go to high schools throughout the school year. So we also are limited as far as where we can go with respects to um, you know, blood collections in general. What's the most critical need? Right now we're really, really looking for platelet and plasma donors. So that's a little bit of a different process. That's something that we only do in the donor centers. Those aren't, that type of donation isn't available out like at your community blood drive, for example, like a church blood drive or a VFW, something along those lines. That's only done here at the Burlington Donor Center. Um, Platelet and plasma donations are more often than not utilized for uh, patients undergoing some type of chemotherapy or cancer treatment, some type of radiation therapy. Um, so it's very important that uh, we really have a really strong pool of those products because those products only have a shelf life of five days. There's a large variable um, of volatility that just exists uh, with those products itself. So we really need to make sure that we have plenty on stock. I know currently the situation is where our regional medical director is actually evaluating, hospitals are sending us information. He's actually evaluating the patients that are requiring platelets and plasma and they're, they're uh, you know, rationing the amount that they're transfusing right now because the, the stock is so low. Um, so platelets and plasma are really, really where we need to get people through the door. The difficult thing about that is that it's much more of a commitment. It's not typically, you know, you come in, you donate a pipe, usually takes about an hour. To donate platelets and plasma, it's a minimum of a two hour process. Um, so that's tough for folks to commit to. Um, but, you know, obviously getting that awareness out. If you come in once a year to donate platelets, that's, that makes a difference for somebody. You've issued an appeal for platelets and plasma. What exactly are those and how is that donation process different? Platelets are what basically help your blood from clotting. So um, cancer patients, when they undergo chemotherapy, a side effect of that is that the platelets actually die um, from the chemotherapy. So we have to reinfuse that person with a fresh set of platelets, you know, in order for them to not bleed internally. So, um, you know, it's kind of chemotherapy kills the cancer cells, but it also kills the good cells as well. So that's, that's the difficult thing with that. Um, but with plasma donors, a lot of times those are utilized with um, specifically AB is the blood type we're looking for for plasma and A positive is the blood type we're looking for with platelets just because those are the universal donors with respect to, with respects to platelets and plasma. With plasma donation, where that is utilized is oftentimes burn victims or premature babies. Um, it helps to redevelop tissue, um, so that's a very important aspect of you know, the healing process for the specific patient. 
besides these ones that we've talked about, are there other kinds of donations? Yeah, so we have two, we have actually three types of donations that we offer. We offer the platelet plasma donations, which like I said, is only done in the donor center. Um, that is always gonna take you pretty much two hours, come and go. Um, we also have what we call double red cell or power red cell donation, which is where you donate two units of red cells. And we actually, we don't keep all of your blood. Um, we only keep the red cell portion and we give you back your platelets and plasma. So it's actually, that takes about 35 minutes. So you're hooked up to a small little machine that actually draws your blood out and then it separates it, keeps the red cells and puts back in the platelets and plasma. So, you know, you have to be a little bit of a bigger size in order to donate that. We wanna make sure that you have enough blood volume to donate two units of red cells. Um, and like I said, that takes about 35 minutes, but O negative is really where we're looking for that. O negative, O positive, because that's really where the red cells are utilized from those blood types. Everybody should be aware that their own specific blood type has a certain niche as far as uh, where they fit in in the donation process, so. How can people donate? Well, you know, it's a lot easier now with technology. We have, um, we have a blood donor app that you can download, which actually, um, you know, if you have a smartphone, you can schedule your appointment through there. It also sends you appointment reminders. And actually, it gives you a timeline as far as, like, how many donations you've actually donated through the Red Cross, um, which is kind of neat, so people can keep track of them themselves if they'd like. You can always just, um, you know, go online to redcrossblood.org and schedule an appointment, see what's available for you. Um, or you can just take a look and kind of see what's filled and what's not, and you can determine, you know, well, maybe this might be a good time for me to walk in if you can't just commit to an appointment. But you at least will get a sense of where, uh, you know, when the tra what the traffic patterns are with, with respects to the donors coming in and out. The Red Cross has multiple locations across our region, as well as community blood drives. For more information or to find the donor center closest to you, call the Red Cross toll-free at one 800 Red Cross. Our next segment features a tractor. Of course, it's not just any old tractor, and its job is quite specific. Keith Silva tells us more. One of the biggest environmental challenges facing Vermont is water quality. Big challenges require even bigger solutions. And if there's one thing to say about this high boy tractor, it's big. It's about six foot three to six foot four under the belly, and then the booms run about nine feet in the air. The only one of its kind in New England, the High Boy is the latest and largest tool in UVM Extension's toolbox to encourage and support farmers to use cover crops, the key strategy to improve water quality. It's a high clearance spray rig that's been modified to uh, spray uh, cover crop seed onto corn crops, standing corn crops. So essentially what we do with it is we calibrate the sprayer to put on the right number of pounds of whatever mix we're using and then we essentially use GPS to identify where in the field we've been and where we're going and we drive up and down the corn row spraying seed under the canopy. Typically the corn will be between seven and nine, 10 feet tall, and the machine just rides in between the corn rows with the arms out, with the drop tubes down, and it just kind of goes over the top. It looks like it's kind of floating over the corn. Cover cropping, like all farming, depends on timing. Cover crops are often planted either after harvest or as soon as the cash crop is established. The high boy allows Sanders to experiment with the timing of planting a cover crop. It also helps face other challenges like mother nature. The weather lays your best made plans in ruin. We have got other methods of cover cropping. We can interseed up to about three feet. That whole time period when we would have done that and wanted to do that, it rained. And, and you can't interseed in the mud so you can't do it, so you've missed that window. The high boy is all about extending the window. Research has shown that it doesn't compete with a corn crop for nutrients because the corn is so far ahead of the cover crop that it's actually pulling nutrients from a different portion of the soil profile. So early season short is good 
and then that window gets closed. Then we're into the to the four to ten feet corn, and and that's what this is for. And then after harvest is another window. The weather will only leave a couple of those windows open. You won't hit them all. Farmers plant cover crops to halt erosion, manage nutrients, and increase soil health. When nutrients are taken up by the cover crop, they can't run off when it rains. Nutrient runoff is what impacts water quality in Lake Champlain, especially in northwestern Vermont, where Sanders is working. Franklin County is like the 23rd highest producing corn silage county in the country. So we grow a lot of corn silage, which is, has a very unique set of problems with it. You're pulling all the residue off and you're really leaving the ground bare. Grain farmers, you have residue. Well, we don't grow a lot of grain. So the need for cover crops in Franklin County is very high. The shallow areas in Lake Champlain, like Missisquoi Bay and St. Albans Bay, are susceptible to algae outbreaks. When excessive amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen, two nutrients found in agricultural runoff, combine with warm water temperatures, the results can be toxic. UVM and the farming, the agriculture community is working very hard to try to address the issues with the lake. Farmers have five to seven hundred dollars per acre invested in a corn crop that they're letting UVM drive a machine that they've never seen before over the top of and and there's risk involved with that and they're taking that risk on uh, to try to do their part. Farmers are very uh, adamant about contributing to the solution and the, the, uh, the farmer letting us do this on a lot of acres to try to figure out what works best is a testament to their willingness to participate in the solution with the lake. We're not trying to pollute a lake. We want to keep all our nutrients and everything. You, it costs you money to put them out there, so you want to keep them. And all Larry farms. Jarvis and his family operate one of the largest dairy farms in Vermont. He hosts field days at his farm so other farmers can see for themselves the kind of practices he's using to improve the soil and decrease his farm's impact on the lake. At the 2016 UVM Extension No-Till and Cover Crop Symposium, Jarvis took part in a panel to talk about the nutrient management practices that worked best on his farm. And I've got 200 acres committed to the high boy. Um, and so he came onto our farm and we had different type of uh, cover crop mixes, uh, varieties with some radishes, clovers, uh, winter rye, uh, annual rye grass. And we try it in different fields because we want to be able to see it on a wide variety of soil types also. If you, you create a good environment for your soils via a cover crop, it's going to give you a great return. We always need to learn Go ahead, try different things that are, are going to help the environment, help your, your overall uh, soil health, uh, which in turn is going to help you know, your production of your crops. And uh, you know, with the water quality issues that we're having, you know, it's, it's good for the public to understand that we're, you know, we're good stewards of the land. We want to keep everything intact, and uh, it's a win-win for you know, the, the, the public and the farmers themselves. UVM Extension purchased the High Boy through a Natural Resources Conservation Service Conservation Innovation Grant. The flexibility and versatility the High Boy provides to farmers who want to use cover crops goes a long way to improving Vermont's agricultural and environmental resources. UVM Extension has a huge investment in cover cropping and this was kind of the logical next step for us to continue to expand our knowledge base. There's a lot of pressure on the agricultural community to do their part for cleaning up the lake. And one of those practices that has been identified is cover cropping to reduce erosion and help with nutrient uptake and build soil health, all good things. Sure, the high boy is big, but the impact it may have on Vermont farms and Lake Champlain is even bigger. In Swan, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence.
Thank you, Keith, and thank you for joining us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.